As I said last week, ministry is about who? It's about people. Ministry is about people. So we have to go out and we have to reach the people, right? If we're going to be fishers of men, we can't be keepers of the aquarium. It's one thing to it's one thing to take care of the people here, but it's another thing to go out and go get more people, right? Because we have a mission to do, and that's what the whole topic has been about. That's what the whole series has been about, reaching people. Uh, that's the title, Reach. We talked about the man and his preparations in the first three messages. We talked about, uh, we talked about the mission in the second two messages, and now we're talking about the method, or rather, let's say, uh, in this particular message, we're going to talk about the tactic. Last week, we talked about the target. This week, we're going to talk about the tactic. And our tactics are the way we are going to do the things we're going to do. How it is we're going to do the things we need to do in order to reach our target. So this morning, I'm going to give you just three simple things, three simple tactics we are going to use to reach our target. So I want you to follow along quickly with me if you would. Number one, the very first thing we're going to do in order to reach our target, the first tactic we're going to employ is going to be the tactic of being proactive. We need to be proactive. Here are maybe a a few things that you've heard before. There is no time like the present. How many of you have heard that? Give me a raise of hands this morning. There's no time like the present. Okay, almost all of you. How about this one? Don't put off until tomorrow what you can do today. How many of you have heard that? Yes? Lucy, raise your hands. A little bit higher. A little bit higher. I'm trying to get a poll. Okay, most of you. How about this one? This one's really good. Uh, Do what today others won't, so tomorrow you can do what others can't. How many of you have heard that? Anybody? Anybody? That's a little bit more obscure, but it's still there. He just just heard it now. So you've all heard it. Raise your hands. Everybody raise your hands. You've all heard that saying. Okay, you've heard it here this morning. Uh, That's by a guy named Brian Rogers, apparently. Brian Rogers. And uh, there's a lot to be found in the Bible, though, about being proactive, A lot to be found about being proactive. Several words in the Bible are very similar when it comes to these words. For instance, let's use this word, be watchful. Be watchful. That means be proactive. It means be ready, right? If a person is ready, they're proactive. So be watchful. Uh, Mark 14, 38 says, watch ye and pray, lest ye enter into temptation. The spirit truly is ready, but the flesh is weak. So be watchful, be ready, be prepared, right? In being proactive, there's a preparedness. The second thing is be sober. That's a good word, be sober. It doesn't mean not to be drunk. It means to be sober. It means to to be ready. Another word is be vigilant. 1 Peter 5, 8 uses both these words. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. So you have to be sober, be vigilant, be ready, be prepared. How many of you guys are Boy Scouts? Anybody, any Boy Scouts in here? You're a Boy Scout. Okay, good. So he was a Boy Scout. I was a Boy Scout. What's that? I was, I was a dropout Boy Scout, too. It's true. I only made it to life. Now, your brother, though, he made it to Eagle Scout, so that's legit. That's legit. Yeah, that's hard to keep up with. But I, was, I made it to life, and one of, the, one of the slogans that the Boy Scouts had, does anybody know? Be prepared. Be prepared. Be ready. And the only way to be prepared is to be proactive, And that's what we're looking to be, is be proactive. And we need to be sober. We need to be vigilant. We need to be ready. And Paul says in Acts 21, 13, he says, For I am ready not to be bound only, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. So he said, I am ready. I am ready. One of the goals, one of the targets that we're reaching for is to have a name change that is inclusive to the Quad Cities, right? Not exclusive to the north side, but inclusive to the Quad Cities. And in order to do that, we need to be proactive. We need to be ready. We need to be prepared. Let me give you an example. Ben, why don't you come on up here, son? I'm going to uh, push my son around a little bit. He, uh, he's going to stand here. You can face me. You don't have to look at the crowd. Face me. I want you to stand here. Put your feet together. Put your feet like that. Now, if my son is here and he is to be proactive to be or be prepared, be ready, this is not the stance of a ready person, is it? Because quite honestly, with two little fingers, if he doesn't move his feet, I could easily push him over like this, 
because he's not what? Say it with me, prepared. So in order for him to be prepared, in order for him to be proactive, he needs to have a ready stance. Is that not right? So son, I want you to get in a stance that kind of is more firm. Plant your feet like this. Kind of spread your leg just a little bit like that, okay? And I want you to kind of lean in kind of like this, and I want you to kind of put your hands up like this, right? And if I was to push on, on Ben, he's able to push back, right? Now, I have this thing, and most of you children know, it's called dad strength. <laughs> I am stronger than him. There's just no doubt. So no matter how strong of a stance he had, dad always wins. <laughs> just want everybody to know that. Isn't that right, son? <laughs> so dad will always win. So he could push back, but dad will always push stronger than him because I have dad's strength and I always win. Thank you, son. Have a seat. A prepared person, a prepared person is proactive. They are getting ready. They are in a stance. They are ready to take something on. And when I think about reaching our target, one of our tactics need to be preparedness. If we are not prepared as a church, we are failing. We are failing. And being proactive is doing the things that are necessary before things need to be done. Doing the things that are necessary before things need to be done. Now, I, th I would venture to say that many of us in this room are procrastinators on some level. On some level. Some people say, well, I don't really procrastinate. I am always right on top of it. How many of you get your taxes done January 1st? Probably not many people. So you're a procrastinator. How many people wait to do the dishes when there's at least one or two dishes in the sink? So you're a procrastinator, right? The thing is, is we procrastinate on some level. That's not being proactive. Being proactive is doing the things that are necessary before things need to be done. We need to respond before we have to react. And friends, can I tell you this morning that those are two different words? A response and a reaction. A response is very intentional. There's intentionality when we are responding to something. But when we react, it's not a response. It's usually tends to be maybe even a little violent. It's that knee-jerk reaction. It's not a knee-jerk response. So we need to respond to things. And in Proverbs 22, verse 3, it says that a prudent man foreseeth the evil and hideth himself. A prudent man foreseeth the evil and hideth himself. A godly Christian, a godly church, foresees a problem and they hide themselves. They have a response that's necessary in proportion to, to, to what is coming their way. So when we see something, we say, we don't want to just react when this happens. We want to respond accordingly. And in order to do that, we need to be proactive. I think a lot of us in this very room need to be proactive. And I'm one of those people. I'm one of those people who maybe I'm not as proactive as I need to be. I'm not as prepared as I need to be, as I should be. And we all can do better in this, in this fight. Let me give you just a quick application. 2 Corinthians 6 2 says this Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Let me ask you something. How many of you folks have heaven tracks in your shirt coat right now? Will you hold them up? Will you hold them up? Anybody? Come on, let me see. So, Terry, you got one in your, you got one in your coat? And we've got, we've, got, uh, we've got Howard, and we've got Brooks, and Joel. We, we have, and, and Deb. Okay, anybody else? And Kathy, good. Anybody else have heaven tracks on them? This is, I'm not to embarrass those that do not. I am just to make a point. We are prepared. We are prepared because today is the day of salvation. I think that a godly Christian is ready to respond to those opportunities that come their way. How many of you folks have been in a situation where you just wish you would have had a track? I, 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 I am one of those people. Years ago, I said to Dana, I said, I said, I want you to put a heaven track in every single one of my shirts. When you do the laundry, I said, I want tracks in there. I want tracks in there. So I never go a place without having a track. 
and she doesn't listen. I still to this day have done. <laughs> Usually what will end up happening is she'll do the laundry, and then they'll end up a crumpled up little ball in, the, in there, and, and uh, I just didn't hand them out fast enough, you know. But uh, I can say at least I try to be prepared. The other day we were leaving the house. I was sharing this with the folks on Wednesday, and, and, uh, and Josh, just because it's routine or something, I don't know, we were going out, and he hands me a sack of tracks. And I was, thank you, son. I appreciate that. And I was had a, I had a, a, a meeting with some bankers the other day. I had uh, Joel and Brooks was with me, and I kind of had them sit off to the side so they can see how you schmooze a banker. And so I had a couple bankers there, and, and I walked out, and I said, Ben, I need tracks right now. I need tracks. He comes in, hands me some tracks, and because I had tracks, you know what? I was able to invite them out to church. Now, I could have been more prepared, and I could have had a stack of tracks on my desk, but usually they're in my shirt coat pocket, and I didn't have them there, so I was ill-prepared. We need to be prepared because today is the day of salvation. And the only way that we're going to uh, really embrace these opportunities to witness to people is to be ready. And can I say the same thing is true when it comes to a church as a whole? When we are not necessarily changing our direction, because we're not changing our direction, we're going to be tailoring some of the things we're doing for instance, having a bigger auditorium. Wouldn't that be nice? We would love to respond accordingly to more people coming in, but we can't have more people come in if we don't have more parking. And even if we had more parking, we wouldn't have enough seating. So we are trying to create an environment, if you will, that would be a proper response. A proper response to what we need. And we need to do that as a church. One person said that tomorrow is often the busiest day of the week. How many of you can say amen to that? Tomorrow is often the busiest day of the week, right? So we need to do what we need to do today. And Plato, he said that the beginning is the most important part of the work. Do you know why the beginning is the most important part of the work? It's because that's where it all begins. That's where it starts. We need to start somewhere, and we need to do it quick. You see, most of us, by nature, are procrastinators, and we don't do the things that we should do today. We just kind of put those off into the distance, and we say, tomorrow is another day, but tomorrow is usually the busiest day of the week, as opposed to saying, we're going to do that right now. We need to get started. We need to get started soon. We need to be proactive in our mission, right? If our mission, how many how many uh, soldiers go out to the battlefield without uh, reviewing what's known as a battle plan? How many Christians go out into the world just kind of ill-prepared? They're not proactive. They're reactive. And they say, oh, no, no, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do, you know, as opposed to saying, no, what we're going to do is we're going to have a plan. We're going to have a strategy. And we're going to go out there. We're going to make sure we have tracks in our, in our pocket, tracks in our hands. I tell you what, if you walked around Home Depot with heaven tracks in your hand like this, uh, one of two things is going to happen. You're going to sweat so much, you're going to destroy the track and have to throw them away. Or you're going to get so sick and tired of hanging out of these things, you're going to be like, dude, I just want to give this to you because this is like a burden for me right now, and I cannot leave this place until I give these away, okay? Are you going to heaven when you die? I don't know, but just read this track. My pastor says this is the best thing for you, and I believe it, so just take this heaven track. Please do my pastor a favor. Do me a favor. Just take this thing, would you please? I mean, you walk around with these in your hands, you're being proactive. You're being proactive. But you put them in your car, you leave them in your house, you leave them in your desk drawer, out of sight. What do they say, out of sight? Out of mind. mind. You put these babies in your hand, you walk around, I'm going to give these things out before I leave this place, or I'm going to ruin them. And you don't want to ruin these. You know how much these things cost a piece? Like four cents? Like four cents a piece. So don't just drop money or crinkle it up or tear it in half like I did by accident on Wednesday. You want to make sure that you are handing these things out. We want to be proactive. So secondly, not just be proactive, but we need to be productive. We need to be productive. There is a, a blend of two words here. I want, to, I want to kind of pull them apart and put them back together for you. There's two words. It being efficient and being effective. A person can, in a sense, be efficient without being effective. And then a person can, in a sense, be effective, if 
follow me, they can be effective without being efficient. The two words put together, I feel, is a good word. It's productive. Webster defines productivity this way. Having the quality or power of producing, producing, that's effective, producing, especially in abundance, that's efficient. So producing abundance. Another word they use or that Webster uses uh, to define productive is effective in bringing about or yielding results, yielding results, benefits, or profits. If ministry is about people, then if we are productive, we are yielding results. We are yielding results, aren't we? We have, uh, we have efficiency and effectiveness. We need to not just give them the plan of salvation, which is the gospel, but the plan of sanctification, which is discipleship. We need to blend these two things together, and we need to be proactive and productive. We need to be productive. A lot of Christians are not proactive, and because they're not proactive, they're not productive. We tend to kind of be just casually living our lives with no real goal. We have no goal of necessarily reaching the lost. It's, a, it's an afterthought. It's a secondary to maybe our primary goal. We, uh, we don't have our heaven tracks in our pocket. We don't have our heaven tracks in our hand. It's become secondary. And we need to do better at this. We need to actually engage people. And how are we going to engage if we don't take this thing seriously? We need to take what we have now in reaching the community. We need to take it seriously. In 1 Corinthians 9, 24 and 27, Paul says this, Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but watch this, one receiveth a prize. One receives the prize. What he's trying to do here is draw an illustration. He's trying to give us an example of, of a group of people who are playing a game, in a sense, running a race, but one person is going to win. And he says in verse 24 of 1 Corinthians 9, so run that you may win. And I love that. So run the race that you're going to win it. Don't run it as if we're all going to get a trophy. One person is going to get a trophy, right? Do you understand that? We're not just all playing the game when it comes to reaching people with the gospel. This is the real deal. This is life or death. This is eternal life or eternal death, one of the two. And so he's saying a lot of people are, are, are living the Christian life. A lot of people are living the Christian life but, 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 don't, but don't live it just to play the game. Live it to win. That's what he's saying. He's saying, go out there and run the race as if there's only going to be one trophy at the end. There's going to be one person standing up here saying, cha-ching, cha-ching, you're right? There's going to be one guy with the trophy that says, I'm the winner. But here's what happens. Most of us, because we're not proactive, we're not productive. We're not, actually, we're not actually running to win. We're just running because this is what we're supposed to do. When I was in, uh, when I was in sixth grade, I ran a little over a five-minute mile. I'm not even sure I could run a mile right now. I don't think I could. I had, I had these little wheels on me. Man, I could run. I could run. I ran a lot. Because most, I, the reason I ran so fast, I was scared of my dad, and I got a lot of exercise. But I, tell you, I ran, and you know what? It was just because it was what we were supposed to do. And now I, run, I ran really well, but I didn't necessarily run to win necessarily. I just I could do it well. I think a lot of Christians are kind of just living the life, and, they're, and, and maybe some of them have tracks in their pocket because it's what they're supposed to do. 
Maybe they, maybe they, maybe they, they come to church because it's just what's expected of them. Maybe, maybe they give in an offering, even just a token, not, not, a, not a tithe, but maybe just a token, just because I, I don't want my neighbor to think that I didn't put something in here. Maybe, maybe we're just, maybe there's people in this room, and I don't know who you are, you know who you are. Maybe you're just kind of casually living the Christian life. You're not running the race to win. One person's going to win, right? That's what Paul is saying here. He says in verse 25, And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we, Christians, an incorruptible. I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, watch this, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air. Paul's saying this in verse 27, But I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means after I had preached to others, I myself will be a castaway. He's saying, I am a disciplined competitor. I'm not just here casually just living the Christian life. I'm running to win this thing. I'm running to get other people to win as well. And in, in trying to encourage other people, and that's what he's doing here, he's trying to encourage other people to run with him. Run the race. Take it seriously. Just as a farmer is to farm and a fisherman is to fish, a Christian is to fulfill the commission. And it's the great commission. It's the great commission. This means we have to work hard. And Proverbs 24 is a great example of someone who didn't work hard. Verse 30 to 34 says, I went by the field of the slothful. You all know what a sloth is, right? Sloth is that uh, the guy on, uh, what movie was that? Ice Age? The guy in Ice Age that laid on the tree? Anyway, I think that's kind of cute. Does Max kill sloths? Does he? Does he? No, he doesn't trap them. Where do you find a sloth? Is it really? Okay, well, he doesn't do that then. What do I know about sloths other than what I learned from Ice Age, right? Seriously? <laughs> Is that horrible or what? I know nothing about sloth except for what I learned from a cartoon. It's not even a very good one. Anyway, I went by the field of the slothful and by the vineyard of a man void of understanding. Verse 31, And lo, it was all grown over with thorns, and nettles had covered the face thereof, and the stone wall thereof was broken down. So here's what happened. He saw this field, and he saw a vineyard, and it had tremendous problems. A sloth ran the field, and a man void of understanding ran the vineyard. Verse 32, then I saw and considered it well. I looked upon it, and I received instruction. And this is what he learned, verse 33. Yet a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep. Do you know what all that means? You know what the sleeping is like the eyes are closed. Slumbering is when maybe your eyes aren't closed, you're just laying in bed, like after you wake up or before you go to bed. You're just, that's why they call it a slumber party. Like nobody's actually sleeping, they're just slumbering. So a little, a little sleep, a little slumber, and a little folding of the hands to sleep. This is kind of the preparation to go to sleep. And you kind of, kind of go to sleep, kind of fold your hands like this. I think it's interesting, though. Most people focus on the sleep, the slumber, and the folding of the hands. But notice the word that comes before all of those, a little. A little sleep. A little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep. Watch this. So shall thy poverty come as one that traveleth, and thy want as an armed man. This person, these people, have no activity, and they produce no results. No activity, no results. Instead, it's... A big procrastination problem, isn't it? It's a big procrastination problem that's happening. We need to remember, friends, that maintained fields don't just happen. They require something called massive action. If you want to maintain your fields, if you want to maintain your house, 
If you want to do the things that are necessary to minister to people, because ministry is about people, it's going to require what? Massive action. It's going to require being deliberate. It's going to require us being intentional. It's going to require a certain level of being proactive and being productive. One guy says successful people don't focus on how hard the work is, but rather how rewarding the results are. I love that. Because, you know, there's a lot of work to do, and, and, and there's a lot of race to run. And uh, I don't know if any of you are runners or not, but they have like the 100-meter, the and then they have like the 200-meter, and then they, they have like the 800-meter. And, and uh, I don't know what all it means. I just know that the bigger the number, the harder it is, you know. And, and so, uh, so you, can, you can run in this race in the 100-meter and not be fit for the 200-meter. And some people are fit for the 200 meter, but not the 100 meter. Some people are just faster with long distances, right? And some people are, are faster with shorter distances. And there is a lot of race to run no matter what, and it's going to be a lot of hard work. And I think about our tactic, our tactic to reach our target. This whole methodology of ministering to people is going to require a lot of hard work. And we can look at this one of two, way, two ways. We can say, hey, well, it's just so much work that we just, can't, we just can't possibly look at that. That The finish line is so far down the way, it's, just, it's a lot of running to do. It's just a lot of hard work. But I just love this quote because successful people don't focus on how hard the work is, but rather how rewarding the results are. Don't look at how hard the work is. Look at the benefit that comes after ministering. Minister to people, and people's lives change. And people begin to love their spouse. They begin to love their children. They begin to work harder at work and enjoy their job. Guess what, friends? They get to spend an eternity in heaven. That is a very rewarding result to know that people are going to spend an eternity with us because of our actions, massive action. We have to work hard. We have to be productive. Thirdly, and final, be professional. This is part of the, the tactics we're going to use as we, as we implement these new things that we want to do. We want to be, we want to be uh, uh, proactive, number one. We want to be uh, productive, number two. And number three, we want to be professional. We want to be professional. Uh, this does not mean being perfectionistic. All right? I'll have to admit, I have a tendency towards perfectionism. I do. I, I like things just right. I, I, I like things uh, a certain way, and uh, oftentimes that hinders me. It's true. I have that, that uh, not necessarily a positive quality. But I am talking about being professional, being professional, which is different than being perfectionistic. One person said that the, the great uh, irony of perfectionism is that while it's characterized by an intense drive to succeed, it can be the very thing that prevents success. Perfectionism is highly correlated with the fear of failure, which is generally not the best motivator, and self-defeating behavior such as excessive procrastination. Some of us want to do it so right that we keep putting it off until it can be done right, and then we don't ever do it. There is, uh, there is a, a term used in, the, in Silicon Valley, uh, better done than perfect. And to some extent, we need to employ that, but I would like to be professional nonetheless. So uh, the tactics we're going to use are in part being professional. We want a job well done, don't we? We want to do a job very, very well. And a job that glorifies the Lord. Being professional, I think, glorifies the Lord. Doing a job well, Colossians 1.10, that ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. 1 Corinthians 10.31, Wherefore there, uh, or whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, do it all to the glory of man. Now, it doesn't say that, does it? It says do it all to the glory of God. Everything we do, do it to the glory of God. doesn't matter if you're eating or you're drinking. Do it to the glory of God. 1 Corinthians 14.40, it says, Let all things be done decently and in order. <laughs> Referring to the organization of the church. Isn't that interesting? Do it decently, in order, 
whether you're eating or drinking, do it all to the glory of God. I think there are churches, and, and, and we're, we're, not, we're not perfect on this by any means, and, and there are many, many things that I know that I do that are not as professional as what I ought to be doing. And, uh, I, you know, they, off, they say that you're, you're often your own worst critic, right? And sometimes when I look at myself and I have to watch these dumb videos from time to time that we record, and sometimes I can't believe that there's people. Our biggest hit page is our podcast page by thousands. It's crazy how many people listen to the podcast. And I, I listen to them, and I, I think, i got to shut that guy off. Man, that guy's an idiot. And I can't hardly watch myself, and, and I just need to be more professional and not perfectionistic but I need to be more professional. And there are things we do in this ministry that I want to do better. And when we, uh, as we reach our new target, as we reach our new target, the, the, the tactics that we use, one of them I want to be, to be professional. I want everything to be done very, very well. I want it to be done decently and in order. I want to I wanna do things right. That's what I want to do. Not perfect, but Right. I want it to glorify the Lord. I want, us, I want this ministry to be a, a solid representation of, of God working in it, right? If, if God was to sit at your dinner table with you and your spouse, if God was to sit at, uh, at your dinner table with you and your children, if God was to come in and he was to if he was to be an uh, undercover boss, how do you think he would respond? Let me ask you, if the Lord were to walk into this church service right now, in this very, very second, imagine with me the Lord walking into this church service. Would you be as focused as you need to be on the message? Would you get a well done, now good and faithful servant? Would the Lord look at you and say, man, now that is a characteristic of a godly person, godly man, godly woman? Would he say to me, Joe, you are, th- you, you, you are running your church very, very well. I'm proud of you. Keep up the good work. Or would I have to say, Lord, there are so many things that we could do better, Lord. We can do things better. We need to be more professional. We need to be more professional. We, we need to be more productive, and we need to be more proactive. We need to know what's going to happen before it happens. In a sense, be ready for those things and then produce and then be productive in all of those things and be professional while we're doing it. Would I say, Lord, I'm doing the very, very best I can? I would have to look at him and say, Lord, we can do better. We can do better. Here's a couple things that we can do better. A couple things we do well, but two things that we can do better. Number one, giving people a warm welcome when they come into church. And when I think about relocating, and when I think about having a bigger auditorium, when people come into the place, we need to have a a warm welcome, don't we? Isn't it nice to have a good smile? I mean, you know, behind every smile is a set of teeth, though. And then we just got to smile with our mouth closed like this. We want to have a warm welcome. Several times in the Bible, it speaks of greeting one another with a holy kiss. I think we ought to come in and kiss each other. No, I'm kidding. (laughs) I had to say that. I'm sorry. No, I I think that we need to be, you know what? One of my favorite things, I'll be honest with you, is all you ladies come in and just hug each other. You know, the guys, they come in and some of us guys hug each other. We we do a guy hug though, you know, where you kind of have your hand, you kind of, you kind of shake and that's kind of like the barrier between you and that other person. You shake and you hug kind of like with the shoulder, you know. Rolando came in this morning. I was like, good to see you, brother. Good to see you, you know. Because <laughs> it'd be really weird if there was anything else. Anyway, so, but I, I really enjoy, I enjoy seeing people come in and just embrace one another and, and love on one another. I, I just, that just makes, that just is a warm welcome, isn't it? Doesn't it feel welcoming? We could do it better, though. We can do it better. I think a warm welcome is is important to a professional atmosphere. I think friendly fellowship is also wonderful. Friendly fellowship. This is the step beyond the warm welcome. You know, you can come into a church, have a warm welcome, and and not have friendly fellowship. That's when you see the set of teeth, you know. (laughs) That's when you really see what they're made of. And and but I, I think that we can do that better. 
I think that we can have friendly fellowship. Many times in the Bible, it talks about uh, being hospitable. I've mentioned this before, uh, be a, but, uh, but be a lover of hospitality, a lover of good men, sober, just, holy, temperate. 1 Peter 4, 9 says, use hospitality one to another without grudging. What a wonderful, what a wonderful thing. Invite people into your home and have friendly fellowship, right? Have a warm welcome and have a have friendly fellowship. Be friendly toward one another. Some of my, uh, uh, if you were to ever look at the, my, uh, my text messages or my emails or the letters that I write to people, most of the things I say at the very bottom, I, I sign it, your friend, Joe Huss. Because I want people to know that, that they can be a friend of mine, that I want to be friendly toward them, that they're my friend. And, and not just as a... As, as a uh, you know, insincere type of signature, but a really sincere thing. You're my friend, and I appreciate that. And we need to be friendly toward one another, right? A man who has friends must show himself friendly. Got to be kind, tenderhearted toward one another. And in conclusion, let me just say this. We're not talking about changing the principles, the the underlying principles of, of our church. Those will remain the same. But as we talk about reaching our target and the tactics we use to get there, there are some things we want to change. And there are some things we need to get better at. So we need to be proactive. We need to be productive. And we need to be professional. Right? When people come into this place, they ought to say, man, that is a warm, welcoming church that is looking forward to the future, that's running the race. They're not playing Christian. They really believe this thing. They take it very seriously, and they're very sincere in what they believe, and they're very professional. I don't want people to leave this place and be like, dude, they didn't have one clue what they were doing. They were just winging it the whole time. You do not want that to be the mantra of our church. They just wing it. I want them to say, man, they just are a wonderful church that is a good representation of the Lord. We want to be a good testimony before God, right? Be a good testimony, not in just the way we dress, but in the way we act, what we say, when we say it, our friendliness, our warm welcome, our friendly fellowship, all of those things should be all part of our professionalism, not our perfectionism. If you're here today and you don't know Christ as your Savior, if you don't know where you're going when you die, you can know before you leave this very room, right? Watch this. This hand right here represents you and me, and this heaven track represents all the things we've done wrong. And there are so many of them, aren't there? There are so many things we've done wrong. I've done things wrong today, I've done things wrong yesterday, I've done things wrong, I mean, multiple things yesterday, multiple things today, there's so many things, and the Bible says that all these things we've done wrong, that's sin, and that sin keeps us separate from God, but this sin must be paid for, and the Bible says that the wages of sin, the payment for sin is death, someone has to die, 2,000 years ago, Jesus came to die on the cross to pay for our sin. That means you don't have to pay for it. We trust that Jesus made the payment for us. We go to heaven for all eternity because of something he did for us. It's not something we did for him. Faith alone in Jesus Christ alone is all that's necessary for salvation. Isn't it easy? Isn't it just so easy? We just believe Jesus died for us. Trust in him that he made the payment for our sin. And that's the gospel I'm going to give That's the gospel I'm going to continue to give. Salvation is so easy. Let's do that. Would we do that? Would you share that with people? Would you share these heaven tracks? You got five men there, and I'm just challenging you to do that. And it would be awesome to hear a name and a story. It'd be awesome to hear a name and a story, a name and a story of somebody that you've talked to. We've got this guy, Luke, the guy that I handed this track out to at at the Home Depot that that doesn't, doesn't, doesn't like Christmas. But I gave him a track anyway. His name was Luke. I was gonna, I was gonna, I was gonna keep, keep on. I was gonna be like, dude, you got a great name, it's a Bible name. But I, I didn't, you know. I just eased off. And but that's a name and a story. Isn't that neat? This other guy, this other kid named Zane, who's at Menards with a with a one hand, a name and a story. We need names and we need stories. And it'll be an encouragement to other people to do it too. To hand out tracks, to try to win them, take it seriously. This is life or death. 